Okay, so we have a new episode of Legends and Leaders, and today it's great to have Alex here, the CEO of Flyer. Alex, you've created a pretty interesting piece of technology um, that's helping a lot of airlines become much more modern and really take advantage of the data that they get. They have a lot of data, and you've you know helped implement AI and, and other technology to you know better understand ticket pricing and help manage um, the type of flow that they have. Um, so I'm excited to have you here and to get into your story. Perfect. We're very happy to be here. Thank you, Ben. So Alex, early on, you know, how did your passion for entrepreneurship and, you know, kind of this airline space begin? Great. So as a kid, I grew up at the airfield on weekends. So with my grandfather and my, my family, we would go to the airfields uh, and, uh, to fly and to watch planes fly around us. And like we were on pilot. So that's kind of where the aviation passion came from, I would say. I wanted to be a pilot when I was a kid, like many kids, I'm sure want to be. Um, but I think that passion kind of continued later in life as I uh, got more involved with software and started software companies. And I eventually tried to combine those two things by the time I got to Silicon Valley um, about 10 years ago. Hmm. Now, why was Silicon Valley such a great place for you to build? So while there's a lot of great companies being built in Europe, um, there's a bit of a saying and that it's like mediocrity is enough, right? Or just be normal. And I always wanted to go after a bigger market, a more interesting environment to build a company in. And I always look at the US and Silicon Valley in particular when it comes to technology as a place where all the factors, all the ingredients for success are present in excess, right? Whether that is capital, whether that is other great smart people to build companies with or to learn from because they've done that before. So when I was 22 years old, I packed my backpack and I left for Silicon Valley um, to start a company. Initially, that was focused on the consumer side of travel. How do we help travelers make better decisions around when to buy and things like that? Things that Hopper, for example, does extremely well uh, these days. And then eventually that morphs into the company that Flyer is today, which is very focused on providing technology to airlines and to hotel chains uh, to make them smarter and better at what they do and to improve the experiences the traveler has with them. <laughs> and how did this like... What was kind of the root of this idea? Was there like a personal experience that you had that made you say like, hey, we really need to improve the system? Like why, why specifically this idea? Yeah. So as I traveled more and more, I started to realize that I started to feel as if the technology that underpins the airline industry is actually quite archaic, right? From the, the legacy boarding pass that is still printed in a way that makes no sense to the check-in process that is not very smart in recognizing recurring recurring passengers, recurring travelers, to the lack of payment options, to the slowness of a flight surge, um, and to these kind of weird pricing mechanics that seem to be going on behind the scenes. And as I dug in deeper um, into that world, I, I kind of realized that, um, for example, um, the reason why when you book a flight, it says Y class, M class, N class, um, it's because back when airlines used to basically publish a physical printed book that had a bunch of uh, published fares. And then when your travel agent would call the airline, they would basically be told, okay, today Y class is available. And they would look up, okay, what does that mean for the price? And um, charge that money from the customer and then put the ticket. The reality is it's like that legacy construct of an offline world was then taken online uh, mm -hmm. and kind of people stuck with it. So questions that we were asked was, okay, why, cannot we, why can't we just answer the question, what should I charge? with a price? Why does it have to be this convoluted, complicated environment that was created by the airlines? And that's kind of where we started. So like the idea made a lot of sense, right? But it, like you mentioned, it's not so easy to figure out how to do it. So how, how did you start to create this type of technology and then onboard these, you know, these companies and these airlines to work with you? Yeah, so we were a bit of the cat with nine lives when it comes to navigating this industry. So in the travel technology industry, there are very, very few big successes. There's a lot of like long tail, smaller type companies, but there's very few companies going after what I like to call the mission critical systems, right? So we early on, we said, we're going to go after the mission critical systems of the airline. Um, initially, I, we were a consumer company, then uh, JetBlue and Air New Zealand reached out to us and they said, asking the price of my airline tickets, can you just help us kind of price them better to begin with? So that's kind of where it started. And then from there, we got deeper and deeper into the airline and we realized that there are three fundamental systems that need to be modernized for an airline to be successful. The first one, of course, is managing their data from typically 300 different systems at the airline in a logical place. 
instead of the cost systems. Using artificial intelligence as a better way to forecast demand, to forecast optimal pricing, to forecast revenue performance and help them make better decisions. So kind of intelligence and optimization is what we call that. The second piece of technology is the core reservation system. When you read about, you know, outages where, you know, an airline goes offline for a day, it's usually the reservation system that is the problem. And then the third one really is the e-commerce layer. Why is it that booking a flight hasn't really changed in terms of the user experience and the, the workflow in the last 20 years? Like, why is that? Why, why don't we have a shopping cart, right? When you buy a flight, why is it that I cannot book, if, like, um, for example, an executive assistant, why can I not book one flight for one person from A to B and one flight for another person from C to D in the same shopping cart? Why can't I do those things that are already very common in every other kind of e-commerce or retailing industry? So those are the three systems that we focus on, forecasting and pricing, core reservation systems, and then the, the layer, the e-commerce layer that powers the experience that you interact with. And we kind of worked our way to those three things by working with the airlines and by learning more and more about their systems and getting deeper into those systems over time. Um, we were very fortunate to be able to raise capital from the right investors with a very long perspective on developing these technologies because when you go after a mission critical system, let alone three of them, you need to have the ability to survive the development cycle, the sales cycle, the implementation cycle, the adoption cycle. Um, and most startups just don't, mm -hmm. don't live long enough, have, don't have enough runway to get there. We were fortunate to kind of find our way there. Um, and now we're in a great position to, uh, to be an actual alternative to the systems that came before us. So you identified the right problems you needed to solve. You simplified into a couple different areas that were your focus. So when you were pitching a client, let's say like JetBlue, for example, you know, that's a significant airline. How did you go and pitch them when you're a pretty, you were a pretty new company still so at the time? So early on, we adopted a kind of a go-to-market strategy that we don't have today anymore. But early on, we said, hey, we're going to charge you nothing at all for our pricing technology. And we're going to implement it on a subset of your network. Then we're going to measure how much more revenue we generate, right? And then based on that incremental performance, we're going to charge you a performance fee. That worked really well to get in the door early on, <clears throat> early on with customers. However, the challenge you end up having in that case is that one, it's very difficult to measure because how do you compare the performance on Los Angeles to New York to, you know, Boston to San Francisco? Like there's so much variability and noise and randomness in travel. How do you compare different things? So establishing a baseline and a performance measurement was very tricky. And then the second part is one thing I've learned over the years is um, you need to have aligned incentives, right? Like show me the incentive and I'll show you the outcome, right? I think it was uh, Charlie Munger who said that. Um, that's become very true as well. Because when you go to an airline and you say, I, you pay me more if I do better, you actually end up having a bit of a conflict where they have an incentive to have you perform really well, but not be measured as if you perform really well and therefore be paid less. And we have the opposite incentive, so it creates some tension. So today we're more of a traditional kind of enterprise SaaS subscription type business, even though our contracts are typically five to 10 years in term. Um, but early on, we, we, we kind of forge a wedge into the market by doing a performance-based model. If we don't perform, you don't pay anything. If we perform, you, you happily pay us. That's how we get into the market initially with that particular product. Right. So that's clever. I mean, cause then there's no, there's no really inherent risk initially for any of these companies to, Correct. to take The only on. challenge is that we were very optimistic back then as to the implementation time it, it would take to actually implement these systems. And obviously mm -hmm. the longer it takes without getting paid or without having proven that performance and getting paid, um, the more money you're burning, right. Without actually having revenue against it. So there's, there's only so far that scales. Um, and we quickly learned that and adjusted early on enough, but it's a great way in, but not a great way to sustain and grow the business. And we, we adjusted that over the last couple of years. So the last number I saw was that you're helping ensuring, you know, about $13 billion of revenue for companies like JetBlue and Air New Zealand and others is really managed correctly. How did you scale up, Alex, from beginning and offering this as something that was, you know, free in a sense to now managing that and how are you able to handle that type of, ca of, of capital flow and, and really make the right decisions? Yeah, so, so really like the way you can think about it is like we are responsible for other people's revenue, right? So again, that one product that we have, one product line that we have is like the pricing automation, 
And for some context, historically, airlines do pricing on a very rule-based methodology, right? A bunch of spreadsheets, a bunch of rules, they end up configuring. If the competitor difference is this great, then adjust my price like that. If demand exceeds X, right, then do Y to price. That's kind of the way it used to happen. And, and, and what that results in is that 95% of all the prices you as a consumer see in the marketplace were actually an analyst putting a rule somewhere behind the scenes. Okay, so that, However, in that case, you still have kind of the human accountability, right? I employ an analyst or a set of analysts and they do the pricing. What we proposed was basically the opposite. 95% of all pricing would be the output of some magical deep neural network, right? Which is scary, it's AI. And, and we were doing this long before AI became hot, right? So we were doing this five years ago already. So um, the responsibility, the accountability factor changes. So really what we do is we are responsible for billions and billions of dollars in revenue of these major airlines in the form of like automating pricing decisions without a human being in the loop, right? The human can override the system, but 95% of it is like the raw output of a deep neural network. And uh, it actually might make it one of the most tangible, practical, largest dollar applications of mm. deep neural networks, right? Like there's a pricing and revenue result, but that's the responsibility we have. And, um, We've learned along the way that that's a big responsibility to carry and that you have to build the right fail saves and the right confidence in the system to do that well. Uh, we now have expanded that into ancillary products. We also price seats and bags and priority boarding and lounge access and all those kind of things. And we do the same thing in the hospitality space with major hotels like Best Western, for example, in Europe. Um, so that's really kind of where we've grown. Now, how have we grown into that? I think it really comes around from like referenceability, uh, building confidence, and giving airlines or our customers a way to scale into it. We don't force them into a big bang transition, right? Because when you deal with change management or a paradigm shift, you're rarely going to be successful if you do it like overnight with a big bang. Too much buy-in needs to be created to make that happen, especially as a startup. So really the way you do it is you set up your system in parallel to what existed before, and you slowly start shifting volume from one place to the other. And then as that confidence builds, as the results build, customer gets more and more comfortable with that outcome and with that risk effectively, and then you fully transition over. And we do this with all of our technologies, even our reservation system, right? We stand it up alongside the legacy systems from Amadeus or from Sabre that used to come before us, and we slowly transition over. Mm -hmm. Even our e-commerce platform that powers websites like avianca.com, for example, or Sun Express in Europe, um, we stand it up and then we cut over either by market right, or by channel over time, so you build that confidence. And that's been really important in an enterprise kind of mission critical technology to provide a transition path instead of a big bang. Um, and that allowed us to steadily scale up to the kind of scale and volumes we, uh, we have to do. Interesting. So, you know, one of the biggest issues with airlines now is these delays. You know, there's these like kind of unexpected delays that happen. People are waiting hours yep. and hours. You see about, you see them in the news. Of course, it's not, you know, always what's happening, but, um, how do you think that these types of delays can be mitigated? Is it is it something that you guys can solve with AI? You know, what's the root of the problem? And how do you think that so there's a, a couple of components to that? Um, so first of all, the system of record, right, the airline reservation system, um, it's not a coincidence that we we provide a better alternative to that. And that's because in, in historically, um, it's very difficult for an airline to keep track of its products, its inventory, where are my planes, which planes are on which route, and therefore which which crew is tied to which plane. So what you saw, for example, in some of the major, out major outages uh, in the last few years is the problem is actually when the reservation system goes down and then comes back up, the airline doesn't have a perfect record of where inventory, products, passengers, and crew actually are located. So you got to fix first the system of record. Where do I store and maintain my information based on which I make decisions and make sure that you have, you know, not just uptime, but also failover capability for that. So that's the first problem airlines need to solve. And the way you solve that is by modernizing the reservation system, the system of record underneath. That's the first piece. The second part is once you have all that data kind of well managed in one place, a canonical data model, like a data model that fits all relevant information, then you can actually start using smarter decision-making technologies. Like airlines are still very much built around, you know, dashboards that they build and, and, and great tools like Power BI or Looker or Tableau um, or spreadsheets. But the problem with those things is they're not real time in terms of taking action. They require a human to look at the right thing at the right time, the right filters, and then make the right decisions. And we're moving into a world where a delay of your flight or a cancellation of your flight 
could be due to a tiny issue that cascaded because it was caught too late. That's where AI, whether that is LLMs or whether that is kind of deep neural nets on the decision-making side, um, can, can make a big difference, right? You give them access to the right data from a training perspective. You then give them access to real-time data from an inference perspective right, on which they can apply their pattern recognition. And then you either give them a way to escalate to a human who can just say yes or no, simplify the decision, or as you build more confidence, like with our pricing automation, you can let the algorithm make a decision and swap the aircraft or change the crew or you know move passengers to a different flight right? instead of relying them to call a hotline. Right? Like those are the kind of things you can do. So the core data system and the data models, then the ability to like train models on top of that and feed them with data in real time, and then the ability to escalate it to the right person or to automatically make a decision. Those are kind of the steps you have to take to fix these issues that plague the industry. From, a, from an all-time performance and reliability perspective. Uh, that's kind of the way we look at it and the way we help them kind of adopt that. So, so it's a combination between like making, removing the, like biggest bottlenecks with AI and then making the decision process as simple as possible for the human. That's right, exactly. And, and this is why I don't believe you're going to completely automate away the human, but I think the role changes. I think you're going to give them better information. You're going to give them more targeted information. And you're going to give them a simpler way to take action without having to actually do all of the execution steps on their own. And, and, and so we're, we're, we're kind of like giving them superpower, right? We're giving them superpowers through the means of AI and by actually renovating the systems underneath the power at all. That, that's really kind of what we do um, in, in principle. Mm -hmm. And overall, Alex, like how do you see AI being most innovative in this space? So, there are a lot of ways to apply AI in this space. So it goes all the way from the operational side around flight planning. Like how do I plan my flight smarter to better optimize for wind conditions and, or landing slots with busy airports and things like that? And there's actually a bunch of companies that are operating in that space. We don't deal with the operational side. So we don't deal with managing the metal, as they say. Um, but that's, that's one area. Another area of optimization um, uh, relates to kind of the passenger side of the experience, right? Like if you've booked with me before, I can probably propose to you better options of like your seat selection or the, the bags or things like that alongside your booking journey. Then there is disruption management, right? If there is a risk of disruption, how can I be proactive? How can AI be proactive in moving you to a different flight or giving you an alert, um, uh, things like that. Um, so that's again the customer experience side. And then on the commercial side for the AI, which is where we operate much more, is how do I actually automate decisions like pricing to improve revenue performance or to increase the number of people I carry? Because one thing to note is like you don't just maximize revenue by selling all seats more expensive, right? You try and maximize revenue across the seats available. And that might mean sometimes you sell more seats at a lower price and then later you sell less seats at a higher price, right? So fewer seats. So those are areas where AI will make a meaningful difference and a meaningful dent. And then all are like areas like maintenance. Like companies like Palantir are already working with airlines um, to do predictive maintenance to make sure that parts are replaced before they break down, and before they take the aircraft out of service. So all those areas is where um, AI is starting to play a very, very material role. Um, the commercial piece of which is where we primarily focus. So one of the areas now that I think people are trying to improve with the, the whole airport experience is the check-in process, um, whether it's through TSA pre-check or clear, you know, those have become pretty popular. You know, how do you see this check-in check process evolving yeah, so for the I average I actually think person? that over the next 12, two to four years, we're moving to a world where your phone actually becomes your identification device, right? So you can actually check in and check that you're a real human that matches your passport all with your phone. Right. So, um, so that by the point you get to the airport, you can literally walk through security, just like clear, just like TSA or global entry is doing in the U S so we're actually moving into that very, very quickly. If you combine that with more modern scanners, right. So the scanning systems of TSA are improving quickly where I think we'll get to a point in the next five years, where thanks to AI, you can probably walk through these scanners without having to take off your shoes and take your laptop out and, you know, even put your bag on the belt if you will. So there's a lot of innovation there. So I actually think over the next five years, partly due to AI, partly due to hardware, partly due to your phone serving as your identification device, 
walking through the airport, walking onto your plane will be as smooth as walking in and out of a store. I think more similar to um, Amazon is launching these stores, right? Where you can walk in and you can walk out without ever touching checkout register. I think that type of experience is coming to airports and airlines um, in the next couple of years, making it much smoother uh, and actually help deal with this ever increasing volume of travel. Like, like travel is going to grow by 50% over the next seven years in terms of passenger volume. So that, that's what I expect in the next five years to happen. So just kind of like circling back on a different point, um, you know, COVID happened, the whole travel industry pretty much shut, you know, shut down. How did you guys survive? Like, how did you manage to keep so, the company going? Um, we were ready to go to market actually in late 2019, early 2020 with our pricing technologies. And we were going to raise a capital raise on the back of that, right? Having got a few customers and having built these products and kind of having product markets fit. And it was March of 2020. So in the middle of COVID, the world was shutting down one after another, country after another country. And uh, we were supposed to raise money and no investor would touch travel because travel had completely halted. So it was March, uh, mid-March of 2020. And I got on a flight to the Middle East. Uh, I had a few connections and I had a few friends of mine that were fortunate to make some introductions. I'm still very thankful to them for that. Um, uh, I met um, a, a, called a large family office, let's put it that way. Uh, in the Middle East, um, they, I talked them through that I actually believe that this kind of shutdown of travel is going to allow airlines to start renovating and reevaluating the technology. Right? Like, there's no better time to swap out wow. mission critical technology than when nobody's flying. Um, turned out I was right. They actually believed in that thesis and they gave us enough capital to bridge through COVID. Uh, back then, we were 30 people. And then coming out of COVID or today, we're well over 700. Right, so we grew from 30 at the brink of death at the beginning of COVID um, to bridging the company through on the back of a thesis that COVID would be an accelerant for technology innovation, and finding a few investors that placed that bet, basically, um, and then it kind of accelerate to where we are where we are today. But, yeah, I mean that's pretty pretty innovative to figure out like an angle there to. I mean, it makes sense. When are the planes really ever grounded besides that? You yeah, know, that and time it was a period. big bet. And I, I, will be, I will be quick to admit that while I do believe that, like, well, while we did believe that that was going to be the case, it was also the only argument we could viably make in front of an investor to raise the capital, right? Like, what am I going to say? Am I going to say that, like, you know, travel shut down, give us some money, we're going to hibernate for three years and we'll see you later? That was not an option, right? So we, it was the only argument we were able to make, but it was also the only argument that actually turned out to be truthful. Um, uh, and that kind of give rise to the growth that we saw after. So just the last question I have, Alex, you know, at this point, what do you aspire to accomplish? What are some of your short-term and long-term goals personally and for so the company? I wake up in the morning with a desire to keep building things. For as long as I am making a dent by building technology, products, teams, organizations that make a meaningful difference, and in our case, we're we're building, the, we're building the infrastructure that powers 11% of the global GDP, right? Airlines, hotels, railway companies eventually, et cetera, cruise lines. So the long-term view, maybe working my way back from that, the long-term view is we're going to be the infrastructure that underpins the biggest industry in the world by contributing GDP-wise, and that is growing incredibly quickly. If I bring that in a little bit shorter term, like midterm, of course, trying to build a very scalable, very... Uh, profitable, free cash flowing business. And we're actually really close to that without saying too much. And then short term, it's really about like, what can Thanks. I go and solve today, next week, next month um, with my team, with our customers um, to kind of keep the momentum towards building something that makes an impact and um, building something that at the end of the day makes travel better for billions and billions of people you know, that, that show up at the airport or show up at the hotel or think about traveling to begin with. Um, we want to be there for all of them um, while building a valuable infrastructure layer underneath that massive industry. That's really what we're trying to do. And for as long as, as that continues to be the case, I will stay committed to this business. And I'm excited by the growth. We've been two and a half, three Xing our revenue every single year. But we will do that again over the next 12 months as well. That's more than enough reason for me to get excited in the morning. And as long as that's present, uh, I will keep doing so. Well, Alex, I appreciate you coming on and sharing your story. I think you're you're targeting a great area that really needs some improvement in technology, and it's 
know, it's good that, they're, that you're building in this avenue because it's going to benefit so many people, millions of people worldwide. So I'm excited to see what's next. And Thank you for having me, man. Have a wonderful day.